This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day, wherever you're listening from, and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week is episode number 591, and we welcome the current ACGIH board chair, Dr. Mary Lopez, and the immediate past board chair, Dr. Mike Allen Becker. Uh, before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. They are the reason IAQ Radio continues to be free for our listeners. IAQ Radio Association sponsors are the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. Learn more at acgih.org. The Cleaning Industry Research Institute. Learn more at cirscience.org. The Indoor Air Quality Association. Learn more at iaqa.org. AIHA, healthier workplaces, a healthier world. Learn more at aiha.org. And the Restoration Industry Association. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. IAQ Radio Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories. Learn more at AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Doug Conan. Aerotech Environmental in Dayton, Ohio, who was first to identify William P. Yant as AIHA's first president. The IQ Radio Trivia Question for today, Friday, June 26, 2020, has been sponsored by IDEA is a solution chemistry company providing unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Here's today's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. In what year was ACGIH's Threshold Limit Values for Chemical Substances Committee made a standing committee? Back to you, Joe. All right. Thank you, Cliff. Okay. I want to do a quick intro of our two guests, Dr. Mary Lopez. Dr. Lopez retired from military service after 33 years as an Army officer. She currently serves as the chair of the ACGIH Physical Agents Committee. She's been an active member of ACGIH PAC since 2004, serving as a subject matter expert in ergonomics and human factors, and as the vice chair from 20, 2005 to 2010 and chair 2010 to 2018. She has served on the ACGIH board of directors since 2019 and was elected ACGIH board chair for 2020. She's also a certified professional ergonomist and a licensed occupational therapist. We also have Dr. Michael Ellenbecker. He's committed to improving the health and well-being of workers exposed to chemical and physical agents in their work environment. He is now a professor emeritus for almost 30 years. He taught the occupational hygiene in the Department of Work Environment at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. In his continuing role as the co-director of TURI, he manages a staff of 15 and has guided the Institute's research programs from its inception in 1989. Welcome, uh, Dr. Ellen Becker and Dr. Lopez. It's great to have you both and get a chance to talk a little bit about ACGIH and uh, threshold limit values. And then we're calling this one the science of guidelines and standards. So uh, let's start with, um, with Dr. Lopez. I want to ask both of you, you know, you, uh, you, you're very involved with ACGIH. You obviously see a need for people to be involved in groups like ACGIH. Tell us a little bit about why you became so active in the group. Let, let's start with you, Dr. Lopez. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. We really appreciate the opportunity to, to join you on IAQ Radio. Um, you know, I was in the Army, and we use a lot of the ACGIH standards for our 
guidance guidance about heat exposure, lasers, um, and just about everything, chemical exposures. Um, so we we um, were very familiar with it. Uh, I was invited to join the group when they were talking about the ergonomic recommendations, and that was my area of expertise. Uh, I have to say though that as I have grown to to um, understand the importance of ACGIH, uh, um, I become even more passionate about this organization. Because if you think about it, this is the only organization in the entire world that is making recommendations based solely on the science. And, and Mike is going to talk a little bit more about the rigorous process that we go through to develop these recommendations. Um, it is not any standard that's enforceable, although other countries do pick it up. But we only look at the science and get the best information out to the field and um, the rigor that it goes through in the development of these standards is, is very impressive. So uh, I see a need and I, I think that it makes a difference when it comes down to protecting worker health and just focusing purely on the science. So again, thanks for the opportunity. Our pleasure, and and Dr. Allen Becker, let's let's talk a little bit about why you how and why you got involved. You've been teaching, you know, occupational health for many many years. What uh, what got your interest in ACGIH started? Sure, Joe. Thanks and again. Thanks for having us on. We appreciate it. So, uh, I uh, I became a certified industrial engineer way back in 1982, and back then uh, ACGIH was only open to industrial agents to work for government or uni unions or universities. So I was happy to join. We're now open to anyone. We changed our membership some years ago. I've been a member of both uh, ACGH and AIHA, the American Industrial Hygiene Association. But I focus my efforts with ACGH because of the same reasons Mary talked about, because of the important work the organization does on setting threshold limit values biological exposure indices, looking at indoor air quality issues. Um, uh, so it's been an important uh, factor in worker health and safety and protecting workers and also the general public uh, uh, from exposure to toxic agents, physical agents, chemical agents. So it's just been a very uh, important organization. It's a small organization, relies on volunteers, both for the board where Mary and I serve, but also on the on the committees that we're going to talk about, uh, and so it's important that people, you know, scientists, professionals, step forward and volunteer their time, and, and Mary, Mary and I are very happy to do that. You know, we we want to talk today about the science of of guidelines and standards. You both mentioned how important science is to you and and to ACGIH in developing these, but let's let's kind of set the parameters a little bit or get the definitions. I was going through the ACGIH website and I noticed that it said the threshold limit values and biological exposure indices are developed as guidelines to assist in the control of health hazards. Um, these recommendations or guidelines are intended for the use in the practice of industrial hygiene to be interpreted and applied only by a person trained in this discipline. Uh, they are not developed for use as legal standards, and ACGIH does not advocate their use as such. However, it is recognized that in certain circumstances, individuals or organizations may wish to make use of these recommendations or guidelines as supplements to their own occupational safety and health program. I kind of wanted to focus on what's the difference in your mind, and we'll start with you, Dr. Lopez, between a guideline and, and a standard. Um, and why are these called guidelines and not standards? Uh, again, it's the, it goes back to the enforcement. Um, these are recommendations, and we publish this based solely on the science. Um, this organization does not have any legal authority to um, create or enforce standards. That being said, um, because it is so carefully developed, that many organizations and countries actually use these as their standards um, and uh, as in their, in their guidelines. And as I said, in the military, we often leveraged the ACGI standards in our protective um, thresholds for our military members. Um, but it's very different. This is not an enforcement 
um, agency. And I think that's the, the, the biggest differentiation. Mike, do you have anything to add to that one? Yeah, so, you know, and as, as I'm sure many of the people listening are, are more than familiar with, you know, we have lots of, <laughs> excuse me, acronyms. So uh, permissible exposure limits, those are set, those are set by OSHA and those are legally enforceable. So those are regulations. OSHA has been doing that since 1970, 71. ACJ started, I'm not going to give away the answer to your, to your quiz, uh, but started setting TLDs back in the 1940s. Um, and uh, so we've been setting guidelines long before OSHA. People wondered whether we would go away after OSHA came into existence, but we haven't because we are much more nimble in setting and responding to new information than the federal government. The, the process that OSHA goes through to establish a new PEL or modify an existing one is very cumbersome as it should be because it's a legal standard. Uh, so as a result, in the 50 years since OSHA has been doing it, they've only set about 25 new or revised permissible exposure limits uh, for chemical substances. Uh, ACJ sets about 25 a year uh, of our recommendation. So we respond quickly to new scientific information. So we're getting information out there on guidelines to the practicing industrial hygienists in a much more uh, a rapid and responsive way than the federal government. So this is why industrial hygienists, practicing industrial hygienists still rely on ACGIH to give them good guidance on exposure. And I think that, that, that those are important words that he just said that we need to pay attention to, um, the, the nimbleness and the responsiveness. And, and we recognize that in our organization that there are changes in, in the field. Uh, new chemicals being developed, new technologies evolving, and how do we get good information out to the field in a timely manner? And again, solely based on the science. If you look at some of the early OSHA standards, they use the ACGI standards as reference points um, with heat stress. However, that was the ACGI standard from 1960, and the standards have evolved significantly in the year 2020. And so, um, the other thing that Mike talked about was was the politics, and I think we need to recognize that. Uh, look at how standards in our government and in other countries are developed, even the EU standards. They have a, a consensus between industry, the uh, politicians, and uh, and academia and the researchers. So, so the industry is always pulling it to be just a little bit less protective. And we don't take any of the politics, any of the financial cost factors into account. It's just, what does the science tell us about what's a safe limit for exposure, for chemicals or physical agents or biologic agents, whatever? What does the science tell us? And that's why um, it's a reliable source. It's a trusted source in the field because it is, again, just referencing good solid science. Mike, anything else? Nope, that's good. Good, good summary, Mary. Let me ask this. Uh, before neither one of you can jump in here, these TLVs and BEIs, um, let's clarify first. These are for workers. Um, have you ever looked at maybe setting standards for people that, you know, homemakers sometimes can, you know, should be considered a worker, but, um, you know, uh, for, for maybe people who are a little more uh, susceptible to, to, you know, older people, younger people, or is this just for workers? By definition. Yeah, it's a very good question. Go ahead. Sorry, Mike. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mary. So that's a very good question, John. The organization is always focused on worker exposures, and we have consciously decided not to uh, make that leap. Uh, I think just because we're limited in resources and limited in in size, and frankly, our membership, you know, is is composed of uh, occupational health and safety personnel. But we do, for example, talk about non-traditional uh, work schedules uh, and the fact that the the 
threshold limit value, say for chemical exposure, are based on eight hour a day, 40 hours a week. And if someone is exposed for a, a longer period, they have to reduce those exposures. So we have some information on longer term, you know, the need to have lower levels. And we certainly say in our documentation, don't apply these standards to homeowners, to the elderly, to children. You know, they're based on healthy workers, you know, people who are in their 20s to the 60s who are healthy enough to work. And so we recognize the healthy worker effect and that these standards are not based, are not applicable to someone who might have a chronic illness, to someone who, you know, I'm 74, you know, uh, you know, people my age, they don't apply directly to and certainly don't apply to children. So, so we don't, we don't. Uh, address those audiences directly, but we're very careful to state that our standards would be too high for those audiences. So they have to be used with care when you extend it beyond workers. Okay. Oh, so that, I, I wanted. I just had a, a couple of comments on that in the in the intro, and you read this uh, uh, to be applied by uh, folks who understand what these what these standards are telling us. Um, we have limited it to the healthy worker. That being said, we realize that there are a lot of things that we're realizing that what used to be as, uh, assumed to be a healthy worker often have other underlying conditions, others, other factors going on with them. And so we're very careful, again, to, to set those parameters. And I know that some of these standards are applied by other, other folks outside of that intended, intended um, um, target population of healthy workers. But Mike brought up an important point, and that is our changing work schedules, our changing work environment. We have folks mm -hmm. working from home. We have folks who are working two or three jobs. Um, people who work at, um, you know, in some industry and then come home and then are getting the same exposures in some activities they have at home. And so those thresholds actually change um, because of these other exposures. I have a worker who works, for example, is a radiology technician in a hospital for four hours and then has another part-time job for another four hours and another part-time job for four hours. That's 12 hours of exposure. And then how do those standards apply to him? So again, changing work environment, we really are looking at um, what's happening um, in our environment. Joe, your turn, I'm sorry. I, I think that's an important yeah. distinction, important point. Um, I also want to kind of at the start here said a little, you know, you, you talked about PELs, how they were established by OSHA and that they are law. And then we talked a little bit about TLVs and we're going to talk more about BEIs, but I also want to quickly have uh, Mike, either you or, or Mary talk real quickly about what are recommended exposure limits and how do they differ? Those are from NIOSH, as I understand it. And, and how are they different from TLVs and, and uh, PELs? Sure, I can take a shot at that, American. And so, uh, you're right, Joe. NIOSH is, uh, everyone knows, the research arm of the federal government in occupational health and safety. And the way the act was set up in 1970, it had this model that there'd be a new, you know, concern about a health hazard from an exposure, or maybe an existing PEL or it might be too high, that NIOSH would study that problem and that they would do research. They might review the literature. They might do, NIOSH has a big toxicology group that they could do tox studies. They have a big field studies group. They might go out and measure worker exposures. And then they would make a recommendation to OSHA for an exposure limit. So that's the recommended exposure limit. And they come out with a, with a criteria document that describes that whole, the basis for that recommendation. And then oh, OSHA is supposed to take that REL and consider it and have hearings and get the public's input and think about, again, no, NIOSH primarily looks at, again, the health effects they may talk a little bit about technical feasibility, about cost, uh, but they primarily focus on health effects like, like ACGH does. And then OSHA is supposed to take into account feasibility, uh, technical feasibility, the cost to industry, they get comments from all parties, 
And then they issue a rulemaking that either sets a standard or doesn't based on the REL. And so that's the process that the act was set up to do. And I think, you know, I used to teach my students, I said, I, my, my, in reading the original literature, it was thought that this process would be fairly efficient and that maybe 10 or 20 new standards would be set a year. Well, as I said, it, it hasn't worked out that way. It's been 25 standards in 50 years. So it's, uh, there are a lot of NIOSH REL's that haven't been acted on by OSHA ever. So we have basically three lists right now, and a single substance might have three different recommended standards of, of PEL, which is a legal standard, and then two, RE, the REL and the TLB, which are based on newer information, which are both recommended standards. So most practicing industrial hygienists would look at all three of those numbers and the safest, the most uh, cons uh, conservative approach would be to pick the lowest of the three and be the one that you would use for your workers. In fact, I used to work a lot with uh, some industrial hygienists working in, in Massachusetts. I won't say the company, uh, a very good industrial hygienist I worked with, they had a company TLV, which was 50% of the lowest of those three. So whatever was the lowest of the three, they didn't allow the workers to be exposed to above 50% of that of that standard. So we have a, these different sources, two of them which are more science-based in our recommendations, and one which is the, the OSHA PEL. I hope that there's a longer explanation than you probably were looking for, but I hope it clears it up a uh, little actually, bit. Actually, so. that was perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for, and it was really very clear and well stated, better than I've heard it before. So I do appreciate that. Um, Dr. Lopez, anything you'd like to add there? And also, if you wouldn't mind, um, you know, Mike mentioned how the company he worked for used one half. And I'm just wondering, what was your experience in the military? Um, you know, did they follow just the PELs or did they also look at the RELs and the TLBs? Um, we did. Um, we, we looked at all of those. Um, ACGIH was one of the main sources, but the military also has research facilities. Um, and, and in fact, some of the military research um, is used when we're developing the ACGIH um, recommendations. So um, we use all those sources and, and it comes back to the most protective. Uh, military environments can be very harsh sometimes and um, we need to make sure that we are taking good care of all of there, those military members. Oh, you froze up just at the end there, Mary, but it sounds like we're back now. Okay. All right. So anyway, yes, we, we, use, that. we use that in the military. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, Cliff, before we go any further, anything you'd like to, uh, any questions you had or any, any, uh, any follow-ups? I guess just one question. You know, you've been very, very careful to, uh, explain on mul you know, multiple times and reinforced each other's uh, that you know these are not legal and so on and so forth. Has um, your organization ever encountered any litigation because of what they have published? Uh, yeah, we have. Um, yeah, I've had some unfortunate incidents in the past where we've actually been sued. Uh, you know, I don't want to get into any of the details of that, but it's true that we have had some legal issues because uh, industry, even though the standards aren't legally enforceable, you know, lawyers might refer to them in a, you know, in a, in a worker toxic tort case uh, or whatever. So, you know, they, so the, the, we've been uh, taken to court uh, and the issues had were around the process that we used to set the standards and the scientific validity of that process. So we're, you know, we never lost a, a lawsuit. We've never, uh, we've never been, you know, we've been taken to court, but we've never uh, had a judgment against the process. So, uh, you know, we're, we're very proud of the process that we follow. Uh, industry sometimes is not happy with the number we come up with, and they may have valid reasons why they think it's too low usually. Uh, but the consensus process that we follow to set the standard has never been uh, upended in a, in a court of law, let's put it that way. There have been, been attempts and it's cost us a lot of money, frankly, as an organization. Uh, 
uh, to hire lawyers because of those attempts, but we've never lost a, a lawsuit about the way we, uh, we set our stand. So we're proud of that. Thank you. I think that's a great lead into a little discussion on how you, you know, what is the, what is the process and, and uh, you know, a little, little bit of, about what the rigor is behind the process of developing, uh, let's start with a uh, TLV, and then uh, maybe you could also talk about the, the difference between uh, different types of TLVs. Sure, so Mary, do you want me to take a shot at that first? Or do you want, I've been talking too much, you wanna go Mary? No, no, Mike, Mike has been looking at this process, and so I'm, I'm, I, I propose that Mike outlines it, and then I can talk from the physical agents group about uh, how we applied it in practice. Would that work? Okay. So okay. I'll try to do it without taking too much time. So we have basically three committees. We call it the Chemical Substances Committee, the Physical Agents Committee, and the Biological Exposure Indices Committee. So <laughs> the same process is followed by all three committees. So I'll just I'll probably use the Chemical Substances Committee because I'm more familiar with that. Mary, as you mentioned, Joe, in your intro, is heavily involved with the Physical Agents Committee. So on the Chemical Substance Committee, there's a, it's made up of individuals who are scientists who uh, primarily work for universities and research organizations such as NIOSH or EPA, uh, but also can work for industry. They're members of the committees that work for industry, uh, but they have a recognized expertise in toxicology for chemical substance committee, toxicology, epidemiology, uh, and so forth. So these are all volunteers. The committee uh, recruits new members to keep the membership up. It's independent of the board of directors. The board of directors supervises and approves their recommendations, but the committees are very independent, very purposely so, uh, select their own members. They have probationary members who have to prove themselves before they become full committee members. So only people who are scientifically qualified can serve on the committee. So that's the first guidepost is that these are highly qualified uh, people, they're volunteering their time, they're not paid, their expenses are paid, so we're not buying anyone off, we're trying to buy someone's opinion, it's all a volunteer work. The other important thing to recognize is that um, a main difference between the REL's of NIOSH and ACGH is that, as I mentioned, NIOSH, they're interested in substance X, can actually go out and do an animal study or epidemiology studies or field studies on exposure. ACGH has no money to do studies. So what the committee does is uh, for they're going to study a substance they're concerned about. It. They review the scientific literature on that substance, the published peer-reviewed literature on toxicology and epidemiology. Sometimes uh, non-published literature is also reviewed if there is uh, information that's submitted to the committee, say by a company, uh, you know, we would not have, normally have that information if it's not published. But if it's submitted to the committee, uh, we will, the committee will look at that, but they will primarily re 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 uh, use and rely on the published scientific information. And what happens is that information, one committee member takes the lead to sub, to review all that information, to pull it together in a, in a document, a criteria document for that substance, uh, and will write a draft recommending an exposure limit, either a new one or a uh, revised existing exposure limit based on the literature. The committee then uh, extensively meets and reviews and discusses that recommendation and throws it back at the author, criticizes it, um, uh, talks about it. And so what I call this process is a, uh, a, a expert panel consensus approach. So we have a group of experts. One expert will take the lead because someone has to pull the information together but the whole group will, will carefully consider 
criticize, talk about, discuss, uh, and keep this process up. It might go on for several meetings uh, before a consensus is reached. And only when a consensus is reached is a recommended exposure limit put forward to the board of directors for their consideration. Now the board has a member that's a liaison to each of those three committees. So there's one board member that's listening to this process, but not participating in it, so that they can bring back information to the board as well. So there is some uh, oversight of the process, but not no regulation of the process by the board of directors. So we're, we think this is an independent scientific process that looks at only health effects information, as Mary said, comes to a consensus among scientists uh, and then puts this consensus forward. So that's why we think we're, we're very proud of the process. It's based on science. It's based on a consensus. Yeah, on the TLV for chemical substances, there's 20 members. So it's a consensus of 20 different scientists uh, coming to a, an agreement that Physical Agents Committee is somewhat smaller, it's a dozen, but again, it's a consensus of a dozen uh, people. For the biological exposure indices, it's the same thing, setting a, you know, a level of a, of a, of a, uh, of a substance in blood or, or urine that would, rec would uh, indicate an overexposure from whatever is causing that, that, uh, that substance in, 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 a, in a, a biological fluid. Again, a consensus of, uh, about the scientific information. Uh, and then that uh, recommended exposure limit goes to the board. The board uh, reviews all the doc documentation. Up until this point, the documentation is, is confidential. It's only available to the committee members. If the board votes yes to go forward, then this is a proposed uh, threshold limit value, and it goes on. Uh, it goes on the list in our little booklet. I've got it here uh, of uh, substances. Uh, it's called. Where is it? I should have. It's called notice of intended changes, and so that notice is published on our website. It's published in our booklet, and then people, and then the documentation is also put on the website. That the backup for this notice of intended change. Now the public has three years to respond uh, to, no, two years, I'm sorry, to, to uh, comment on, on this, to say it's too low, it's too high, you missed the study, you miss, uh, uh, represented that study because they can read the documentation. So we get input from everyone. The committee then reconsiders that information maybe changes the recommendation. Uh, in, in the past, they've pulled recommendations off of the list. They've, they can, they've dropped it because of comments that they've gotten. So they take the comments very seriously. They respond to all of them, back to the people that make them, and then finally come back to the board and say, we've considered all the comments. These are our responses. This is our final recommendation. And then the board either says yes or no, and then it goes on to the onto the list of threshold limit values, and the documentation is finalized and made available uh, to everyone to see what the basis is. So that's the, that's the process. We've got about 600 chemical substance TLVs. Uh, in the physical agents, Mary, there's many fewer because there's many fewer physical agents. <laughs> as, as I said, this process goes on on an annual basis. The committee is uh, con continuously updating old TLVs and uh, considering new ones. And on our website, there's a list of the substances under consideration so that people can see what the committee is, is looking at now. But again, their actual uh, discussions, the documents are completely uh, uh, confidential until they come up with a recommendation. But uh, so that's the process. Very good. That's, that's a nice, thorough description, Mike. Before we, uh, Mary, when we come back, I want to take a little break. We have to thank our sponsors. We'll be back in about 90 seconds. When we come back, I'd like to talk a little bit about the physical agents with you and uh, 
get some idea. I think that's something we haven't talked a whole lot about over the last 13 years here on IAQ Radio. So we'll be back with our guest, Dr. Mary Lopez, Dr. Michael Ellenbecker, the current and immediate past chairs of ACGIH. IAQ Radio industry sponsors are Particles Plus engineers and manufacturers of feature-rich particle counters and air quality monitoring instrumentation. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And AEML Laboratories, free FedEx shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and never a rush fee. Learn more at AEMLinc.com. Association sponsors are the Indoor Air Quality Association, a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Learn more at IAQA.org. The American Industrial Hygiene Association, AIHA. Healthier workplaces, a healthier world. Learn more at AIHA.org. And RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. Siri, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute. See more deeply through science and research. Learn more at siriscience.org. That's C I R I science.org. ACGIH, advancing the careers of professionals working in the environmental health, industrial hygiene, and safety communities. Interested in defining their science at ACGIH.org. Okay, we're back for the second half of our interview. Let's start with uh, Dr. Lopez. I want to first, before we uh, talk about the specific um, physical agents, I want to give you a chance to let us know if there are any differences in how, uh, you know, Mike just described very nicely for us how the chemical agents and the TLVs are developed. Is there any difference with the physical agents? No, it's a, it's a process that's established for the entire organization. And, uh, it, and uh, I, I'll talk about it from a practical standpoint because it can be a very long process. Um, I've had experts on my physical agents committee uh, in one field and they'll say, you know, we see this happening in the field and then we'll talk about who are the experts in the field and invite them to participate to join the committee. So as Mike said, at the very start of it, we make sure that we've got the right expertise on the committee and most often they are the most senior folks, the, the, the true experts in their field. Um, then we put together a proposal and we start discussing this issue and start talking about it from different angles. I personally like the physical agents group because we have lasers and radiation and microwave, um, heat experts, cold experts, um, ergonomists um, from a variety of professions. And that dialogue um, is very healthy. So I could propose something as an ergonomist and then the, the radiology subject matter experts might say, well, did you think about this? And that I think gives us a, a better um, outcome because it looks at it not just through one lens, it looks through it through a variety. Again, still coming back to the science. If it's a new um, um, area of concern, we will publish in a notice of intent to establish um, an NIE. We publish an understudy list of what we might be looking at. And in my committee, sometimes those things stayed on for a couple of years as we're just continuing to look at the research and judge where we are with that. Um, publish a notice of intent to change, notice of intent to establish, and then go through that comment period. Uh, Mike described this comment period, and I think that's really important because we publish this um, notice of intent, the understudy list, and we receive comments from the field. We publish the initial draft. We receive comments from the field. Our feet are held to the fire to address every single comment that comes in to the satisfaction of the board. And that's our checks and balances so that we make sure that we've looked at this particular issue, these particular comments from all angles. So I think 
Um, as Mike said, it's such a, a, a detailed, very careful process to make sure that what we are providing to the field is the best science, um, most current science, the, the best knowledge and the best recommendations um, um, for, the, for, the, for um, industrial hygienists and, and to protect the worker safety and health. What was your question? You know, I've got a, a question on specific. I, I would assume this is a physical agent, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's a, I don't know if it's a chemical, but I'm, I'm, what about relative humidity? Um, are, do you have any TOVs or for relative humidity? Yeah, that falls under the heat, heat stress. And so, yes, that is, that is addressed um, um, as, as a component of, of heat stress. Um, and yeah, so, Okay. The answer is so yes. A, that's a physical agent. Heat, heat is a physical agent. It's, it's um, energy in any form working on, on the, the body, the human body. Gotcha. Has there been any renewed interest? In, I mean, recently with all the, you know, the coronavirus and so on, is there any uh, new topics that have come up for ACGIs to maybe start to, start to um, consider establishing TLVs? Um, That's a very good good question, Joe. Yeah, we've uh, we've had a, a, a biologically derived airborne contaminants section of our of our TLV book, but we don't have any TLVs for bioaerosols, and the book describes why we don't. You know, the lack of scientific information on, for example, mold. I know that your group is very interested in mold, and they're you know they're techniques for, you know, counting coliform uh, uh, units and, all, and so forth. We have no standards or no TLVs for biological agents at this time, but we have a, a committee that's been rejuvenated on, bio, on bioaerosols headed by, not headed by, uh, spearheaded by and coordinated by one of our board members, Don Weeks. And so this, we're very excited by this because it's a new effort to rejuvenate this quote this committee which has been on the on the books for many years and has worked hard in the past but had a period when they weren't active so don has taken the lead to reactivate the committee and they're going to be taking a close look at whether there should be some tlds for biologically derived you know bacteria molds uh, viruses you name it uh, they're going to be looking at the whole range and at least coming up with uh, improved guidelines, publications on evaluating and controlling exposures. We, we may not have actual TLVs for a few years, uh, but the, this committee is very active and has the two chairmen, as you said, the, the past and current chair, we're very excited about this. Uh, and then one of our, uh, Mary's and my uh, things we've, we're proud of in our, in our leadership here that we're, and we were just, just ahead of the pandemic and doing this, uh, you know, we, we recognize the committee, the board has recognized that we needed to be working in this area. So we expect uh, good things in the future. We've, we've kind of dropped the ball in the past, but it's, we're certainly working on it now. Well, good. You've got a good guy uh, helping out with that. Don's been a frequent guest on the show and, uh, and actually he, he's the one that uh, got me contact information from, uh, Mary and got this whole thing going. So um, along with Frank Mortal, so uh, we, we really appreciate his input as well. It, it seems to me that you'd have less information available. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know, Mary. Is that is that accurate to say that with when it comes to the physical agents, do you have as many studies to review and, and good research to work with, or is that a little harder to come by than for the uh, chemical? It it depends. It it depends on the the uh, the particular agent. Uh, radiation. There was quite a, a lot of it done in the um, in the past, and so we had a fair amount of radiation basis. Um, other 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 exposures. There isn't as much. There's been a lot of heat studies going on, and in fact, some of the experts on our committees have actually conducted this research. So it varies. Um, Anyway, what? I, I would imagine heat's a real hot topic. Oh, that's is, is, a good joke. <laughs> oh, you did good there. Yay. Uh, heat um, is a, uh, I need a better way to express that one. But I, I would imagine right now that's something that's getting a lot of attention, you know, with. Um, with it the, is. 
it record is, and setting heat that we see around the world. It is, and it, it's a complex, it, it's a very complex um, um, issue. And, and we, when we were talking be before this, this um, show, we were talking about the interactive effect. And I think that that's another area that we started looking at in the physical agents group and, and ACGIH in general. For example, if you have someone who has a chemical exposure in a hot environment, how does that affect the um, human response? How does that affect that injury risk or that health risk? Um, it, it's very complicated and, and just even within physical agents, if I've got a vibrating tool and I've got a heat exposure and I've got a bad ergonomic design, all of those things compound together to change the um, effect on the human being. Uh, those are very difficult ones to establish thresholds and that's why it's important for the end user, the industrial hygienist, to understand um, what that threshold means and how to apply it. So that it's not just a black box, that so you understand what's behind it, and then you understand the interactive effect. We recognize those, we document those, we discuss those in our, in our um, documentation related to the um, agent. Um, but it, it's not, we're not able, um, with this current research, or this current knowledge, to specifically quantify it. Um, my another, Go ahead. Go well, ahead. another area where there's interaction when, where we need to work across the actual committees is certain chemical exposures can exacerbate hearing loss. So that's well known in the literature. So this requires the expertise of both the chemical substances committee and the noise committee and coming up with standards that, that look at the synergistic effects between chemical exposure and noise exposure. So this is something what the committees are working on right now. So good questions on, on synergy and and, uh, uh, and in, in terms of knowledge, Joe, I think chemical substances, it's always a tension, I would say, between trying to get the information out as quickly as we can so we're protecting workers, but not issuing a TLB till there's enough evidence to, to substantiate it. So, we don't want to put out standards that aren't based on scientific studies, but we don't want to wait so long to be so sure that workers are being overexposed. So that's why this expert consensus approach, I think, is so important because it it addresses this balance of when is there enough information so we can issue a, a recommendation to start protecting workers. That's why I think there's a there's a value in the way ACJ is set up that we have these areas. These, these specific um, areas of expertise, these specific groups, but there's an ability to cross feed across them. So physical agents issues can be discussed with the chemical substances and the biologic issues. And so you end up with a more solid recommendation, um, a more all encompassing recommendation. Um, and that being said, there are concerns that we've identified in the field that, um, it's not possible to study. Um, for example, the, the, the physical agents group published um, a recommendation about um, time and sleep and work schedules um, because we recognize that fatigue, whole body fatigue, mental fatigue, is a, a significant health risk. But there aren't um, um, sufficient studies that say this is the amount of time. There's so many intervening variables. This is the amount of time that somebody should work, and this is the amount of time they should rest. Um, There's just not enough um, uh, basis for that. There's too many variables. So we published it as a white paper, a recommendation, so that we can get information to the field, give them the best science out there, um, but it's not, it, we can't establish a threshold. And uh, we did the same with the light exposure, the neuroendocrine effects of light and how that affects your sleep schedule and your general health. So there's, um, there are some of those out there. That time thing is another very, you know, current type of thing. But when, when we've got police officers out there working, you know, 12 hour days, six days, seven days in a row, maybe even longer. Um, and then, you know, how does that affect their health and how does that affect things like decision-making, which I assume, does decision-making, 
does that type of thing ever come into uh, consideration in, in the uh, TOVs and the, you know, the setting of those kind of things? We, we recognize it and, and we have documented that through the physical agents group um, because there is a cognitive effect. You, you have a fatigued worker um, you know, who's done some heavy physical activity who may not be sleeping well, who may have some, some level of stress. Definitely there is a cognitive effect. Risk, um, risk judgments, decision making and reaction time can all be impaired. Um, and then as a result, you have negative consequences from those actions. Um, it's mentioned, it's discussed. There, there's not enough science behind it, but it is absolutely a current issue that we should all be paying attention to. Um, it's a great, you know, I, I should also mention our medical workers out there who are working exactly. tremendous hours and then uh, making life and death decisions, obviously. So that's another area. But I, I you mentioned earlier, I think, uh, Mike mentioned earlier that uh, NIOSH is able to go ahead and, and do some studies when you don't have enough information, when they don't have enough information. Does ACGIH work with NIOSH to maybe recommend that, hey, you know, we're looking at this particular chemical substance and we don't have enough information? Um, can you do this type of research? Is there that type of coordination between the groups? Do you want to take that one, Mike? Sorry. Um, it's okay. I, 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 can, I can do that. Uh, we have I got members. distracted here. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Some, some of our experts and some of our board members are with NIOSH. Um, we don't formally uh, make recommendations to NIOSH. NIOSH ha sets their research agenda. That being said, um, we do have those discussions and um, can make suggestions. And so it's, a, it's more of an indirect route. Uh, a lot of our folks on our committees are researchers in universities um, or researchers in industry. And, and the topics, the issues that we're identifying are influencers for research agendas. Uh, but that's about as far as it goes. I think at this point, we'd like to go to a roundup and ask one final question. <laughs> go John can you unmute Frank and uh, get him in see if he has any final thoughts uh, before we wrap things up hello everyone can you hear me hey we can hear you Frank good welcome back well great great to have you excellent conversation today hello Joe and Cliff Mary and Mike uh, boy, uh, very profound information and I appreciate the opportunity to come in and just praise everyone for this uh, dialogue I hope that it uh, certainly uh, is uh, eventful and, and uh, worthwhile for your listeners, Joe and Cliff. I'm so glad Mike mentioned the, the biologically uh, derived airborne contaminants. Those BDACs for us, and in particular, our bioaerosols committee, uh, certainly um, given the conditions of the global COVID-19 pandemic, are being uh, uh, scrutinized and uh, studied at this time. And uh, boy, it goes to show the, the value of someone like a Don Weeks contributor to this program. Uh, and his impact on the ECGIH and what that then allows for throughout our sphere of influence and how we can uh, you know, go about working together to overcome some of these uh, worldwide challenges. But great show so far today. And uh, thank you for having me on. Anything in particular I can offer or ask or be answered? Hey, um, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Cliff and see if he has a final question for either you or one of our guests. Yeah, I, I do have a final question for Mary. Uh, you know, when you were in the military, um, were any, were you involved in any studies that actually, you know, involved, uh, you know, military personnel and, you know, what may have they been? Uh, yes. Uh, my specialty was ergonomics. And, okay. and so we did, we did lots of studies um, with, with um, soldiers and, and physical lifting and uh, vibration exposures. Uh, that being said, we also worked close, I worked closely with the, the, the medical research groups. And so they looked at traumatic brain injury, um, heat stress exposures, all altitude exposures, um, just a variety of environments that, that soldiers um, find themselves in. 
I just love that research. So, so is that what you're looking for? Oh, yeah, no, I just, I just, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I figured that it wasn't using lab rats. I figured. No, uh, no, no. And, I'm, and, and, and actually folks volunteer for that because you right. see um, in some cases that's easier than the job that they were doing. So right. yeah, I want to be a research <laughs> subject. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. So, cool. it's, uh, all right. Well, let me do this. Uh, I'd like to give both of you the last word here. So uh, let's start with you, Mary. Any final thoughts, anything we missed that you'd like to add? And then we'll do the same with Mike. We appreciate the opportunity. And 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 we've started touching a, a bit on COVID um, through this show. I wanted to take a, a moment to thank all of the listeners for all of the work that they're doing um, to uh, address this very complex um, uh, and, and troubling issue uh, in uh, um, so so I know all of the, most of the listeners are actually practitioners in the field and I want to take a moment just to thank you for the work that you do um, if you have recommendations or thoughts um, as Frank has said and Mike has said ACGIH is open to comments recommendations uh, and we consider all the input from the field how can we do a better job of serving the field. Uh, but thank you, most importantly, thank you for all that you do. Well, I appreciate that, that thought for our listeners because a lot of them are out there. We've got the industrial hygiene community that listens, but we also have a lot of restoration people out there that are you know, cleaning up uh, rooms and buildings that have been, uh, you know, had people in them with uh, COVID-19 and they, um, you know, they, they don't get thanked enough. So thank you for that, we appreciate it. Uh, Mike, before we go, final thoughts? Well, I'd be uh, remiss. Well, thanks first, Joe, for having us on. And uh, Frank would probably uh, say something to me if I didn't, didn't put in a pitch for ACGIH. You know, we uh, used to be, as I said at the beginning, only open to uh, non-industrial people, people who didn't work for companies. But now AI, ACGIH is is open to any practicing industrial dentist, any professional who has an uh, uh, you know, uh, interest in the field. And so we'd love to uh, have more people involved. We're, we're not, you know, it doesn't take a lot financially to get involved with us. We have a lot of resources with the TLV booklets and so forth. So go to our website, uh, either just for good information, but also think about joining us and we can work together to protect the health of workers and the people in the general public as we, as we go forward. So thanks for letting me. Let me make that pitch, Joe. We appreciate that. And we really appreciate uh, ACGIH being a sponsor of IAQ Radio as well. Frank, before we go, final thoughts. Well, that was summed up perfectly by Mary and Mike. And that's really our tagline, if you will, define your science. It doesn't matter what necessarily occupational field that a scientist, a researcher, an academician focuses on. ACGIH has and hopefully has some type of outlet to help uh, define the science and apply that into the field. So we're grateful for the opportunity and the relationship we have with IEQ Radio and uh, looking forward to uh, continuing this collaborative effort. Very good. All right. This is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks to this week's guest, Dr. Mary Lopez, Dr. Mike Ellenbecker, Frank Mortal for joining us as well here for the roundup. I want to thank my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Slotnick, my engineer, John, you got to have faith, and most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners, We'll be back. Uh, we're going to take two weeks off here. The 4th of July is coming up, and then we'll be back. I've got a very interesting uh, show coming up. We're going to talk a little bit about relative humidity and, and its effect on uh, viruses and so on. Uh, but uh, we'll be back in three weeks with the next. Uh, we'll be between now and then, we'll do a couple flashback shows, but we'll be back in three weeks with the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.